Get protected today at shieldmutual.com. Hi, and welcome to what is basically episode one of the new Arm Your Mind for Liberty podcast. I tried a podcast, uh, I think it was last year, I did a couple interviews, and then I just kind of petered off. Um, But this time, uh, my goal is to do at least two video episodes per week of the Arm Arm Your Mind for Liberty podcast. I'm also going to release it on YouTube as a video, uh, which you can find at youtube.com slash George Donnelly. Um, And, um, you know, this is going to be, this is not going to be your average um, libertarian podcast. Uh, I I do another libertarian podcast uh, with uh, John Tyner, called uh, The Art of Liberty. And you can find that at uh, AYMFL, Arm Your Mind for Liberty, the initials, dot com, slash T-A-O-L. Um, or just Google The Art of Liberty. Um, but this is not going to be your average kind of lib- uh, libertarian thing where people go on about uh, libertarian theory, about uh, you know all the reasons why the government is bad. Um, that kind of stuff. That's usually what you see from libertarians, right? My focus is less rational, less rightist, less uh, markety, less, hopefully, less egotistical, hopefully a little less um, masculine in the sense of, you know, testosterone, you know, let's go kick some butt, you know. A little bit less like that. Um, a little more, dare I say, mature. Mature. Um, and constructive. But I don't promise not to offend anybody. Um, so here we go. Yeah. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is, um, you know, in our community, we see a lot of negativity. And I, I see a lot of people living under negativity. So I'd like... This is going to be a force for positivity. Uh, Often we see blogs and and whatnot um, focusing on the government did this, the government committed this atrocity, and the government did, you know, and it's just litany, a litany of, ah, you know, the government's killing us. And, uh, you know, I think that stuff has its place. It's good to know about cop abuses. It's good to know about how many children um, Obama's drones killed in uh, a faraway place uh, this week. But that can't be the only thing we talk about because it's depressing. How is anybody supposed to think that they can do anything about that um, if that's all that we ever talk about? It's kind of like watching the nightly news. It's the nightly news, uh, which I have stopped watching, is about scaring the crap out of you. It's about uh, selecting tidbits of the worst in humanity because it's like when you pass a car wreck, you kind of slow down and watch. Uh, And it's the same thing with the news. You kind of slow down and watch the tragedy unfold. Now, some people say that when people slow down and watch a a tragedy unfold or, you know, a car accident or whatever, that that's, that's one of the worst impulses that people can have, and I disagree. Uh, I think it happens because we're basically empathetic creatures and we're looking to see. It's like a, like a, like a crowdsourced self-selection procedure to see if we can be of any help. Um, so I think that's really what's going on there. But anyway, I want this to be about solutions, about moving forward. Uh, you know, we've already established what the problem is. Uh, you know, not everybody wants to admit it. But I think that, uh, you know, we've knocked a lot of people over the head with what the problem is. Now we need to start talking about solutions. Because it's not enough uh, to just on and on and on about the problem. Because somebody who's completely new to this, you say, everything's all screwed up. It's all wrong. They're killing people in their sleep. You're like, okay, all right, you scared me. I get it. But, uh, uh, okay, now what? Now what do I do? Oh, well, uh, you know, trade, buy some silver and uh, vote for uh, Ron Paul. And there you go. Uh, you know, so uh, that's clearly we have we have an imbalance. We're very good at talking about what the problems are, but the solutions we could use a little more work. 
Um, so I'd like to focus here on positivity. Uh, so for those of you who perhaps suffer from an excess of negativity, and really that's everybody, <laughs> I hope this will be a little ray of sh sunshine for you. Um, and about improving, improving ourselves, improving our surroundings and whatnot. Uh, there is an idea out there that we have to be in touch with everybody. We have to consume all the available information. That's simply not true. If you look at the success literature, uh, people like Napoleon Hill and Carnegie, Dale Carnegie and stuff like that, it's very important. It's quite the opposite is true. It's very important to surround yourself with positive, productive people and environments in order for you to become a positive, productive person. And so, for example, if you're reading a uh, cop block every day, and uh, you know I have um, a lot of respect for uh, Pete and Adam and the other folks who work on cop block, but I have to say that um, you know I think cop block uh, mostly is part of um, things that we need to improve on, to put it that way. Uh, so if you're spending all day on cop block, uh, that that's not a good use of your time, uh, to be honest. I avoid the bad news, the litany of bad news, because that's not helping me. It's not helping. Me. It's, there is, sometimes it helps uh, me to figure out you know, what I should be doing, but it, it's got to be kept in limit. And so, for example, if you have a person that's uh, creating a lot of conflict, uh, that's excessively egotistical, that shares all the latest bad news complete with uh, posting the gory videos on your, your Facebook wall, you may want to put some limits there because that, that's just not healthy, all right? People die every day. People commit terrible things every day. That's a fact of life. But, uh, you know, in order to, I mean, we have a short time on this planet and we want to make a positive, uh, positive impact. And so we can't focus on that stuff excessively. We need to focus on building. Um, I'd also like to, to talk about the revolution versus evolution. Uh, some people, including very prominent people in the community who, um, who I, I like, uh, talk about revolution, you know, let's, we gotta fight, we gotta get ready, revolution, you know, and, um, I just want to kind of say, like, you know, just, just for, can you just forget that word for a little bit? Let, let's focus on evolution. Uh, revolution, the, for the first word that comes to mind is bloody. Uh, another word that comes to mind is armed. Another word that comes to mind is violent. Uh, and also, you know, a revolution is a 360-degree circuit. You, you, you go around and you come back to the same place. And you know how true that is. Look at the American Revolution. Um, it started off quite well. And then what did we get? We got the Constitution, which is a, a federal government um, uh, the basis for a federal government, a centralized government, uh, it was full of loopholes. And as much as you may like it, it was illegally foisted upon people instead of the Articles of Confederation. Um, the Constitution is a disaster. So, and even if you think the Constitution is the best thing since uh, sliced bacon, um, it's it has either enabled the runaway government that we have today or it failed to stop it. So either way, um, the American Revolution has brought us full circle and it did it pretty quickly because even by the time of um, you know the compromise on slavery in the early 1800s, uh, Andrew Jackson's battles against the, uh, the uh, forerunners of the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and of course, uh, Lincoln, Lincoln's disastrous civil war. Uh, it was dead by then. <laughs> I mean, anyway. So let's focus on evolution and let's make it personal. Um, you know, all change starts within. I can't go out there and ask somebody else to change if I haven't done it first myself. So, you know, let's focus instead of on a, on a societal revolution, let's focus on a personal evolution. I'd also like to touch on the difference between volunt voluntarism and agorism. 
This was actually a thread on, I think, the uh, the Agorist or An- ANCAP subreddit uh, the uh, last week, I think. What's the difference between voluntarism and agorism? And I, they're very compatible, and some of us even you know, self-describe as agorist voluntarists or voluntarist agorists. But there is a trend here between, um, on, the, on the voluntarist side, withdrawal. Uh, get a farm, move to a rural area, get off of Facebook, uh, be pure. And on the other side, agorism, which um, is absolutely about engagement. It's about commerce. It's about trading. It's about growing networks. And uh, uh, for me, the people who are doing the withdrawal thing, uh, you know, there is some withdrawal required at the beginning of a, of a libertarian evolution. I certainly withdrew from um, quite a few things. But you have to follow that up with engagement, you have to go out there and get involved. You, you can't be ignorant about your neighbors. You have to talk to them. You have to be involved in civic organizations. You have to go out there and trade in order to be an agorist. So um, this is going to be focused less so on withdrawal, withdrawal and more on engagement. Um, let's see. You know, um, this show is uh, in, inevitably about me. It's about me taking a leadership position. Some people, including a good friend, uh, recently argued that uh, we all have to be leaders. Couple, a couple friends. We all have to be leaders. Every one of us has to lead himself. And, uh, you know, we should seek a model of distributed leadership of anonymous leaders. Because there is no Gandhi or Martin Luther King or whoever you know may come to mind as kind of a central leader, and uh, perhaps that model's even flawed because I mean they killed Gandhi and Martin Luther King. I mean it's it's a central point of failure in in systems administration talk. But the fact is that um, you know can everybody be a leader? Uh, absolutely, anybody can be a leader. You can be a leader, even if you don't believe me. Um, you can be a leader, okay? Is everybody going to be a leader? No, no. Not everybody's going to be a leader because not everybody wants to be a leader. Um, I'm going to say this unabashedly. I am a leader. And I'm not looking for followers. Uh, I never have been. I'm looking for peers, people to work with. Uh, you know, followers, frankly, are tiresome. Um, you know, I appreciate it. I, 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 when people come up to me and say they like what I do, that's not following. That's uh, encouragement, and I appreciate that. But when people look to me to fill their head with thoughts, that they, they just want me to kind of pre-digest everything for them and just hand them the, the finished product, or they want to mimic what I say or whatever, um, that's really tedious. Everybody absolutely needs to think for themselves. But that doesn't diminish the need for leaders. We need leaders. We need multiple leaders. And frankly, I think some people are more uh, personality-wise, perhaps even genetically, disposed to being leaders by, uh, by dint of their character, their charisma level, their ability to speak in public, to control nervousness, whatever. So um, I am a leader. And I will continue to be a leader. And this is one way for me to be a leader by going out there, taking a step forward. Not, not that I'm, I'm not, you know, not in the sense of commanding, like, okay, everybody, uh, step to the left. No, in the sense of being out there and taking the initi- into the initiative and serving as an example. Because frankly, everybody should be doing the kinds of things that I do. I mean, not, not the way I brush my teeth or the way I put my shoes on or something like that. I mean, um, being active and going out there and trying to figure out solutions and whatnot. That kind of stuff. Um, as far as self-actualization, uh, can I outside the liberty thing? Uh, my um, business, Shield Mutual, uh, the Agro's first defense agency, I'm starting a podcast there that is going to talk about that quite frequently. So- um, you know, as, as an example, I wrote an article uh, about a week ago as an example of something, you know, the kind of thinking that we need to have um, and the kind of writing, uh, you know, I, 
I guess I'm tooting my own horn here, and I guess that's inevitable, but um, what, whatever. So this is the kind of thing that, that we need to be doing. I, it's called a whistleblower protection program. And the idea is that, um, and, and this is maybe a leap of faith for people who are worrying about paying uh, you know, for dinner tonight or paying the rent uh, at the end or the bills at the beginning of next month. But we need to be thinking big. And uh, this is an example of thinking big, in my humble opinion. I, I'm sure that someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, we need to be going out there. Uh, we need to be thinking about more than just survival. We need to be going out there and um, facilitating ways for other people to join us and um, to resist. And so uh, this whistleblower protection program, the idea is basically that someone can start an agorist business helping people whistleblowers to escape from their government jobs, uh, blow their whistles, and then find safety and security somewhere else on the globe. It's kind of like a, 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 an agorist witness protection program. And anyway, these, these guys make a lot of money, uh, the, the government employees who have these kinds of things, this information, or that they, I mean, at least they're pulling down a salary. And so maybe they can finance some of this, their transition themselves, you know, taking um, an idea, uh, a page from Edward Snowden's notebook, the NSA leaker. But perhaps we can raise money somehow and, you know, support these people, build a network like an underground railroad of people across the globe who are consciously libertarian-esque opponents of the regime, the empire, because that's basically what the United States government is. It's become an empire. Um, and get these people out of the country to safety so they don't have to worry about their own necks so much. Uh, you know, they can, they can blow the whistle without having to live in terror every day, necessarily. So, um, you know, I, I, my plate's pretty full. Um, and it's mostly with activism stuff. So somebody out there should grab this idea and run with it. Now this, um, the article, I'll have it in the, um, in the show notes. There we go. Okay, moving along. So um, the main topic for, t oh yeah, I wanted to give an update. Oh yeah, but one, one public service announcement. Uh, my website, my Arm Your Mind for Liberty website used to be at georgedonley.com. I moved it to AYMFL.com. Those are the initials of Arm Your Mind for Liberty, just so you know. Uh, I wanted to give a little update on my unschooling activities, uh, with my son. Um, they're going really well. Uh, he's actually playing video games right now. It's noon. And um, he's using the iPad a lot. He's learning to read. Uh, he has a good attitude about it. And um, I'm just really proud of him because he's actually starting to sound out words. He's seven years old, and he's starting to sound out words. He can do some pretty uh, advanced math for his age. He can do multiplication, addition, subtraction. And he's really um, has quite a mature attitude most of the time. No kids perfect based on whatever that standard is so um yeah i do unschooling and i'll do a future episode about that all right the main topic for my show today is women in the liberty movement uh, now last night i asked a question to uh, my friends on facebook is there a lack of women in the liberty movement is there something men need to do to facilitate more involvement on the part of the ladies uh, and i think there's it's obvious there is a lack of women uh in the liberty movement um, even though some people disagree, uh, it looks like most of them, at least some of them are, are men. Uh, <laughs> mm. Um, and I got some interesting responses. I got probably about 15 or 20 comments. Um, let's see. Some of the more interesting ones are about, here it is. Here's one from Alec. Be less blunt and over and overly hyperbolic when it comes to the liberty movement. Just be chill. Uh, let's see. Here's an interesting one from a friend in India who uh, is actually into satyagraha like I am. Uh, satyagraha is Gandhi and nonviolence. He says, women are more driven by their emotions and less aggressive. And at first uh, blush, this may sound 
Uh, stereotypical. But I, I think he's alluding to something deeper, which is um, the aggressivity. And we see a lot of aggressivity, um, not a violations of the non-aggression principle, but a, an aggressive attitude from men in uh, the liberty movement. And I'm sure that I'm just as guilty as this as any other man. And a lot of it happens with the folks who I, I kind of look at as being on the right. You know, guys who exude testosterone and, um, you know, kind of get up in, in cops' faces and make it a one-on-one -on -one thing. Uh, you know, kind of like a who's more macho kind of a thing. Um, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but I, I don't think so. Um, at bottom, there is honestly a lot of ego going on in our movement. And I think that may, you know, I think that comes from exaggerating um, the liberty thing a little bit. Liberty is about individual rights. So we should, um, you know, the logical conclusion at first blush is I have to show off me. It's all about me, 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 me. And um, <clears throat> I think we have to forget that liberty is... We're, we're in an inherently social species. We, we share, we're empathetic, we help each other. Uh, we're not, you know, we're not so different from cats, and I guess, in a, in a sense. You know, you see cats uh, licking each other, cleaning each other all the time. Uh, you see apes doing it, uh, grooming each other. And that's inherently cooperative behavior. And I, I think that we're a little bit out of balance um, when it's all, hey, you got to do this, and hey, you're lazy, and hey, uh, get your guns, and we're, you know, we're going to march, and uh, hey, let's challenge these cops, and let's get in their face, and, um, you know, let's call people out and confront them. That's, um, you know, that, that's valuable, but at the same time, when taken too far, that get, becomes egotistical, and I see this at... Um, my next episode, I believe it's scheduled for my next episode, I'm going to talk about a little bit about how in, um, yeah, that's in the next episode. In some of these events, these activism events, you can see everything devolve into individual action. There's no coordination. And so I think we have to f remember that in order to be really effective, we have to work together. And, and perhaps that's something that's women are uh, very good about. Here is uh, one lady whose comment I enjoyed. She says, I'm busy at home doing the most important thing, teaching my kids about liberty and life and quietly and peacefully influencing the people around me by my actions rather than going around being negative about what's wrong with everything. And it works. That was very insightful. Uh, let's see. Which brings me to an article by uh, James Tuttle and I think Melanie Pinkard either either wrote it completely or contributed to it, I'm not sure, on um, the Center for a Stateless Society website, c4ss.org, which I can't recommend highly enough. Um, I'll just read you a couple passages. Women are seen as caregivers. Women see themselves as caregivers. It is what society expects of us. The expectation is that we are supposed to want to play that role, to relinquish our freedom willingly out of selfless, motherly, daughterly, wifely love. Why would talk of freedom be expected to resonate with people who aren't even allowed to want it? Now, for some people, this, even some women, this may seem an exaggeration. It may, um, you know, may, come, may seem like it comes from a, a point of view that is very anti-patriarchal. Um, you know, be that as it may, I think there's a lot of truth here. Uh, I know that in, um, you know, in the U.S., people are a little more, women are a little more independent, but I know in some other cultures, I've seen places where, and I've traveled the, the world a little bit, where women are just worked to the bone. And uh, it's something that, you know, it's not, there's nobody there cracking the whip. They're cracking the whip on themselves. Uh, work, work, clean, clean, uh, serve food. And, um, you know, that, that doesn't really leave time 
to think about greater things than immediate survival. Um, I, another quote from the article, I do think that the gendered nature of caregiving, how little most men talk about caregiving, how central caregiving is to our lives, and how much caregiving restricts our freedom has to be a factor. And I think this gets back to the ego thing and the cooperative thing. Um, you know, women um, are, for whatever reason, in those cooperative roles and we're taking care of children, taking care of old people, cooking, cleaning, taking care of others. Whereas men, um, at least in my life, I find that I am kind of freed by that to go off and do my own thing. And, and I have been doing my own thing uh, with activism and writing and whatnot. And so that gives me more space to be more individualistic and more focused on outside matters, matters of greater importance. Um, the, the, see that that's not correct. It's not that they're of greater importance than survival. It's, I don't know. I don't know how to say that more complex than survival. I'm not sure. Most women are mothers. If we can't reach mothers, we can't reach women. And, and I think this is interesting because, um, <clears throat> you know, we often see libertarians talking about how, um, you know, the government is wasting money, uh, taxes, Hmm. War, but how often do we talk about health care uh, other than criticizing the way it's done? How often do we are we coming up with alternatives? Uh, and I think health care is a big issue with mothers. How often, how much time are we dedicating, dedicating to talking about things like unschooling and homeschooling, alternatives to schooling, about the elderly, about, um, you know, the disadvantaged? And I think perhaps these are things that fall more into the realm of what women are worrying about. Complete independence and freedom are an illusion. It is an illusion that women are not in a position to hold. We are interdependent and we are only free insofar as everyone is willing to share in taking responsibility for the caregiving that is a fundamental need for all humans. Um, I think that's pretty insightful. There, I mean, we have to eat, we have to bathe, clothes have to be washed, uh, children need to be cared for. Um, you know, some people choose not to reproduce, but uh, I'm a dad, and it's one of the greatest joys of my life to have a child. Whoever is addressing the real-life situations that women face is going to get their attention, whether that is liberals offering government social programs, conservatives offering church social programs, or anarchists offering something new. Talk to me about how to have the freedom to pursue my dreams without leaving a mountain of young, old, sick, and dying to fend for, my, for themselves, and I'll listen. And th this is the conclusion of the article, and perhaps the best part, and the part that we have to pay attention to. Uh, you know, we as libertarians have to move away from the whole uh, egotistical economic thing to a more empathetic uh, cooperative, basic needs kind of focus, you know. Um, you know, for example, take the minimum wage. You know, the minimum wage, uh, the enforced, the, the mandatory minimum wage, the government thing, is destructive to jobs. It, from, you know, you can tell me, you can explain that to me 10 ways from Sunday from an economic point of view, and, um, you know, I'm not an economist. I, I tried being an economics major at the University of Chicago, and I, I dropped that for, for history. You can explain that to me, and my eyes are just going to gloss over, even if, I, even if I accept that the idea, the idea is correct. But for a single mom with, um, you know, one or more kids who's earning minimum wage, just getting by, we have to do more than just prove how it, um, you know, ultimately destroys jobs with an economic analysis. We have to go way beyond that. We have to offer alternatives, and alternatives that have a chance of being implemented immediately. That's not easy. But you know what? Um, things that are difficult are the things that are really worth doing. So uh, I found this conversation really quite interesting. Um...
And even one of the comments on my Facebook thread, you know, I think a lot of women are mentally, philosophically with the movement, but a lot of them are single moms. In fact, I think it's a disproportionately high number. So they kind of have their hands full. Just to go to a rally, we have to spend $50 or more on a teenage babysitter. Maybe you boys should throw us a free Liberty Mixer with on-site babysitting. We'd be out in force. I think that's a nice agorist business idea that, um, you know, could end up um, creating more liberty-oriented families. Uh, there was another article that uh, Nick Ford uh, sent me to called Mansplaining, Explaining Mansplaining. And um, the term mansplaining traces its origins back to a 2008 essay titled Men Explain Things to Me. In her piece, she details two scenarios in which men interrupt her and explain things to her, despite the fact that she, this author, is actually the person who clearly has the expertise in the field. In one scenario, one man actually explains her own book to her, and in each case, the men refuse to acknowledge or listen to her, despite her superior knowledge and the fact that they are clearly factually incorrect in their assertions. Now, you may say this only happens in limited cases, but I've seen it happen. Um, you know, for example, uh, Liberty Forum in uh, New Hampshire, which happens in uh, February or March every year. I've been to that a couple times, and um, you know, it's like around 70% men. And it's very much this dry, passive, I hope they change it soon, but this is, this is what, it, what I saw. This dry, passive thing where guys up front, or girls, ladies, uh, drone on, and you just sit there passively most of the time. And I see a lot of um, men on ego trips, uh, and I see women a little bit intimidated. So this is a reality, and it's, um, we, we do need more women in this movement if we want to expand beyond where we're, where we're at, which is um, not the most advantageous place. We need to change. We need to do things to improve ourselves, to reduce our ego. And, um, you know, I'd like to hear what you think as well. Uh, you can either leave a comment in the comments down here on YouTube or the comments on my blog. Or you can uh, give me a phone call at, let me just bring up this number. You can give me a call at this number and leave me a voicemail message and uh, perhaps I will play it on this podcast. The number is 641-715-3900, extension 255-888. So um, the, give me a call with your question. Uh, record it, and um, I will answer it. Thanks for listening, and there will be another episode soon. Get protected today at shieldmutual.com.